ਨੂੰ Well, good morning. Welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. Welcome back from spring break. I hope you've all had a relaxing time and are ready for the final stretch. Um, as we come into the uh, end of our year for the King Institute, we have a flurry of activity ahead. I'm going to give you a brief word of that and then turn it over to Susan Nicholson to introduce our speaker. Um, I will say uh, that uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Brown here today on our schedule. was a member of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Survivor Speakers Bureau, but the museum is not allowing those folks to travel yet, still with public health concerns. And so uh, it was uh, very kind of Dr. Brown to step into our schedule uh, for, so that we can continue to have a moment where we think about the Holocaust. Um, I have a copy of her book, by the way, which is here. We'll have these for sale this evening, uh, The Sound of Hope, which she'll be talking about this morning. If you want to spend some time with her, we do not have time for question and answer after, but we will go to the Tadlock House and have coffee. If you want to come and join us and spend some time with Dr. Brown, you're more than welcome. And at about 11, we'll go to the cafeteria, and I think we'll be in the Tipton Room. And please come join us if you like, uh, if you want to spend some time with her. This evening, she'll be speaking at Central Presbyterian Church at 7 o'clock this evening. Now, following this, on April the 3rd, we have our own Dr. Bill Linderman, um, who is a very accomplished pianist as well as teaching math, and he also composes music. And in this chapel, he's going to perform his own music for piano, voice, cello, and flute on a Sunday afternoon, and then again on Monday morning, April the 4th. Unusually, on April the 7th and 8th, we have an event. We usually go Mondays, but this is Thursday and Friday. It is the English poet, priest, singer, uh, Malcolm Geit, and I can't recommend Malcolm enough. He's great, and you really should come hear him uh, uh, do his thing Thursday evening at Emmanuel Episcopal Church and Friday morning, unusually for us here in the chapel. Um, Sunday the 10th, uh, we have uh, our Beekner lecture. Frederick Beekner, after whom the Institute was once named, is an American novelist, writer of memoirs, and uh, still living in Vermont. Every year we do an event in his honor, and the event this year is going to be on April 11th. But on the 10th, we're going to have a special moment to commemorate the 40th anniversary of his memoir, The Sacred Journey. Uh, this has been a very widely read memoir. It's of Beekner's early years, um, and uh, we're going to get together with our speaker and read this book on Sunday afternoon on the 10th, and then our final event will be on Monday the 11th here in the chapel with Jeff Monroe. So glad you're here this morning, and uh, glad to welcome uh, Dr. Kelly Brown to introduce her as Susan Nicholson. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelly Brown, our guest lecturer for this morning. Dr. Brown is chair of the Department of Music and professor of music at Milligan University, where she also conducts the Milligan Orchestra. She is the assistant conductor and associate concert master for the Johnson City Symphony Orchestra. Dr. Brown has over 30 years of teaching career where she's impacted and influenced preschool age students all the way to adults and has won numerous teaching awards. Her latest publication, the book, The Sound of Hope, Music as Solace, Resistance, and Salvation During the Holocaust and World War II, has met with critical acclaim both nationally and internationally. It's a fascinating book, and Dr. Brown is an expert on music and the Holocaust. And I, she has taken a, a personal accounts from memoirs and diaries and composers' notes from music and really woven a tapestry and a picture of music and musicians and composers and conductors as they had experiences in the POW and concentration camps. One chapter that was the most fascinating to me was there's a chapter on a composer named Olivier Messiaen, who is a French composer and was in the French army and was captured and placed in a POW camp and composed one of his most well-known famous pieces entitled Quartet from the End of Time. It's important to me because I played the unaccompanied clarinet solo when I was in graduate school at the University of Miami, and it's been one of the most profound, meaningful pieces I think I've ever played, just for the background of that. 
So uh, there was also a story that meant something to me about the clarinetist in the group with Messiana Akoka, am I saying it correctly, yes. uh -huh. who planned an escape attempt and got 350 miles away with two other prisoners before he was caught and taken back to the POW camp and played so well for the commandant that they reduced his sentence to being in solitary confinement instead of a sentence of death or onto a concentration camp because of his Jewish background. So I thought that was fascinating. I did not know that. So please help me to welcome Dr. Kelly Brown. Good morning, and thank you for that introduction, and thank you for this invitation from the King Institute of Faith and Culture. It's wonderful to be here with you. In 2003, I read a biography of Alma Rosé, who was an internationally renowned violinist from Vienna, who was at the height of her early career when she was sent to Auschwitz for being Jewish. And that book changed the course of my life. After I read it, I began to research, explore music during the Holocaust and what the role was there. And I uncovered remarkable stories of conductors and composers and performers and how they used music and stubbornly clung to music however and wherever they could to give themselves hope, to uplift the spirit, to um, have a form of, of spiritual resistance against these um, captors who, who wanted to basically wipe them and their culture off the face of the earth. And, and so that's how my research began. That's how um, I came to write The Sound of Hope. Right away, I, I knew that hope needed to be in the title. Hope is a very powerful thing. The great American poet, Mary Oliver, was contemplating the darkness in our world, and she was trying to figure out what is the greatest countering force to this darkness? What brings the most light? Is it faith or is it hope? In the end, she finally decided that it was hope because she said that hope is a fighter. And I love that. And I think we can see this playing out today in Ukraine. And I think a lot of what I have written about today is, is being relevant anew as, as we're seeing uh, current events happen. And along with this kind of light and power that comes from hope is the power that comes from music. Humans are a musical species. We, we sort of arrive already attuned to music, and music affects us in profound ways. And so there, there is this power in music. The novelist Victor Hugo said that music expresses that which cannot be put into words and that which cannot remain silent. And of course, this power can be used in positive or in destructive ways. And so for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about um, the Nazi cultural agenda, this very intentional uh, campaign of censorship and propaganda, and then the lives of some Jewish musicians who refused to be silenced. One of the important components in any totalitarian uh, state is, of course, to control the media, to control the, the knowledge, the communication, there's power in that, but also to control the arts. And why do they want to control the arts? Well, the same thing I was saying, the arts are very powerful. And music in particular has a unique way to unify and amplify voices. And so music can be very dangerous to a government that is trying to take um, a, a dictatorial kind of control. In 1855, a Frenchman named Gabineau wrote a book called An Essay on the Inequality of the Human Races. And in this publication, he pronounced that European, white European Aryan races were superior than other races. And he used this term degenerate to describe what he saw as other races, impure races. 
And the Nazis are going to borrow his term, and that's going to become the fuel for their eugenics program, for their um, breeding of a master race by removing anyone that would be seen as a degenerate, as an undesirable. So this would be Jews, homosexuals, any person with a disability. And they're also going to take this term, degenerate, and they're going to apply it to the arts as well. They're going to separate out good art, good music, desirable music, and then degenerate art, undesirable music. Well, who gets to make these decisions? Who gets to decide what's good and what's degenerate? Well, Hitler appointed Dr. Joseph Goebbels, to be the Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. Okay, what a loaded job title that is, right? They were just right out there with that. And so he is going to be the person who is steering this. He has been entrusted with these powerful tools, all of, of the arts, and he's going to use it to shape ideas and culture all the way from the youngest children in Germany all the way through uh, the adults. So in terms of music, the German term in Tarte Musik is degenerate music. So what was on the list of this degenerate music? Well, was jazz. And the reason that jazz makes this list is because it was mostly performed by either Jewish or black performers. This would include any kind of atonal or expressionistic classical compositions, so the music of like Arnold Scherenberg, and then of course any non-Aryan composers, so like Felix Mendelssohn, great composer who was Jewish would be on the list, and then any person who was a, a Jewish sympathizer or a political opponent to, to the Nazis. And it's really hard for us to imagine the extent of this kind of censorship. Um, and, and it covered not just like composers who had written these works, but, but the musicians who performed them. So all of a sudden, what disappears from the stages and the concert halls are, are these works, are these music, and then also what disappears is now it's illegal to play their recordings on the radio. It's illegal to sell their records in stores. It's illegal to sell their sheet music in stores. So it is an elaborate campaign. It's complex. It's an unprecedented level of music censorship. It's such a level of censorship concerning Jewish musicians that a group of musicologists in Frankfurt are brought together to create a reference book that lists every blacklisted Jewish musician so that people who are running music stores, who are programming concerts, have a reference book of all the people that they cannot include. And part of this censorship campaign also included an exhibit that took place in May of 1938. This really hateful, um, disgusting poster here in this image is the poster advertising that exhibit. All of the composers who were listed on this degenerate list, their portraits were hung on the wall and gramophones were set up around the space that was playing their music and the public was invited to come in and to mock it and to scorn it. So this is part of this whole campaign. But even though they are trying to regulate music and the arts by censorship and by all kinds of legislative types of way, in the end, the Nazis are finally going to go for the ultimate censorship, and that is genocide. So what is good music to the Nazi agenda? What, where, where does that music fall from? Well, this would be what they would consider good German classical music. So Beethoven, Brahms, Bruckner, okay, all of those kinds. Bach, 
Today's Bach's birthday. Happy birthday, Bach. Um, but of course, uh, Hitler's favorite composer, Richard Wagner. Hitler was also very influenced by Wagner's 19th century writings that were very explicitly anti-Semitic. Wagner felt that the Jews were corrupting German culture. And he even suggested that there ought to be some really great solution to the Jewish problem. So, so that was very influential. Now, Hitler used just all of these revered German composers as part of his propaganda as he is trying to prove the superiority of the German Aryan race. And if he wants to use a particular composer and, and their worldview didn't really fit with the Nazi platform, that's okay. They'll just revise them, okay? They'll just go back and, and rehabilitate them in that way. And that is certainly the case for Mozart. Okay? They wanted to use Mozart as part of their propaganda, but the problem was there wasn't very much in Mozart's life that actually would, would fit with the Nazi platform. Mozart had a more libertarian view of government. He really expressed no nationalistic sentiments in his letters or in his music. And there were other things that should really disqualify him um, such as his zealous involvement in the Freemasons, his close friendship and collaboration with a, a Jewish librettist. But anyway, his was a big name and Hitler wanted to use it. So they began to do a revisionist campaign to turn Mozart into a German nationalistic hero. And it began with celebrations throughout the Reich on the 150th anniversary of Mozart's death. And, and I will say before moving on that, that what happens related to these great masterworks and composers is that it ends up having long-term consequences. The music that, that we love by them for a period of time, because they had been appropriated for the Nazis, it, it gets tainted. And the Allies, after the war, even began to try to rebrand this music and rehabilitate it. They draw attention to the fact that the famous four-note motif at the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, da 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 da, is actually the same as the Morse code for V for victory, short, 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 long. And so they try to do all of these things, but it's a difficult process, and it actually takes a long time before these great masterworks get distanced enough from their, their Nazi usage. So as I already mentioned, this whole censorship and propaganda campaign is a very complex process. Um, there needed to be a bureaucratic, uh, very efficient structure for how to um, oversee it. And so they began to form a large umbrella department called um, the Reich Culture Chamber, and Goebbels was in charge of it. And then under this large umbrella, in 1933, they add seven smaller departments, one representing each of the various art forms. And so the one for music, um, the RMK, uh, came to be, and it's to oversee all that's going on here. So in 1933, when this began, immediately in that year, all Jewish musicians, all Jewish uh, music teachers are fired from their post. It becomes illegal for musicians to perform in public unless they have membership in the RMK. If they're caught performing in public without membership, then they're arrested. And of course, anybody who is on the degenerate list is forbidden from joining the organization. So there you see the tilted stage that, that has been set up here. Richard Strauss was the most well-known German composer living during this time period. And so the Nazis wanted to use him because of his influence, they thought he could give some legitimacy to what they were trying to do. So they appointed him as the first head of, of the RMK. The problem for this is that Strauss's worldview didn't really align with theirs. He certainly wasn't a Nazi. 
he took the position because he thought he could promote serious music, and that was his whole goal. And he thought if the music was worthy, it didn't matter whether the performer or the composer was Jewish. And, and so that was in conflict with um, the Nazi um, campaign, and, and it didn't work. So by 1935, they forced him to resign from this position and replace him with someone um, who is more willing to follow their agenda. So all of this is a little background that's necessary to talk about what I really want to today, which are the lives of some Jewish musicians who refuse to be silenced in this way. I want to start by talking about Herbert Zipper, who was born in 1904 in Vienna. He was a very gifted child at the piano, and by the time he got to university, he found that his real passion was conducting. And so he was really launching a great career. He was traveling all over Europe as opportunities came. And then the Anschluss. Then the Nazis invaded Austria and in March of 1938. And two months later, the Gestapo knocked on his door. Two months later, he was thrown into a cattle car with several broken ribs from the butt of a Nazi rifle and he was headed on his way to Dachau concentration camp. And he said that that train ride was the defining moment of his life. His life now was divided into BD and AD, before Dachau and after Dachau. While he was in that cattle car traveling to this camp, he decided two things. First, he resolved himself that he would not live in fear. And second, and more importantly, he rededicated himself to the practice of generosity. And music is going to play a role in that, a very big role. When he arrived at the camp, the Nazi guards were forcing the prisoners to sing songs and pretend that they were happy to be there. When it came Zipper's turn, he burst out Beethoven's Ode to Joy with its message of the universal brotherhood of, of all mankind. He was assigned to be a human pack horse. He was to carry heavy bags of cement on his back all through the camp. And rather than let himself fall into despair or into bitterness, he decided to use this as an opportunity to get to know his fellow prisoners and to bring them a kind word or recite them a poem or sing them a song. He wanted to bring beauty amid such ugliness. He eventually organizes some um, performers and they meet and rehearse and secret in an unused latrine, and they give weekly concerts for their prisoners. And it does so much to uplift their spirits, to give them some sense of hope, to give them, um, I guess, restore some kind of humanity that was being stripped from them every day. One day, he and a friend that he had known before um, the war, Yura Sofor, who was a playwright, they were walking near this gate at Dachau where the infamous words are, Arbeit macht frei, work will set you free. And they began to talk about it and they decided to write a song, a song of resistance, a song that used parody as defiance. And what came from their song was what we know of as Dachau lead or Dachau song. The stanzas, and there are many of them, really tell the truth of what the conditions were like. Sharp barbed wire with death is laden. Our world it does surround, and the heaven without mercy, frost and burning sun sends down. Far from us are all our joys, and far our homeland, far our wives. As we march to work in silence, thousands fearing for their life. 
Then the repeating refrain that happens after every stanza. It is the parody of this Gates message. But we've all learned the lesson of Dachau by now. As hard as steel, we won't bend. Be a man, comrade. Stay humane, comrade. As all your work sees it now. For work frees us in the end. Okay? Of course, there was no true freedom for these prisoners. So they write this song, and they begin to teach it to the prisoners. One whispers it in the ear of another. One transfers it over here. Pretty soon, this song is spreading throughout Dachau, and people are singing it. And then pretty soon, it's spreading to other camps as prisoners are transferred. And, and it's a wonderful act of defiance. Soon after writing this song, Zipper and Sofor are transferred to Buchenwald where conditions are even worse. They are assigned to clean the latrine of prisoners who have typhus. And Sawyer contracts typhus and, and he dies. Miraculously, Zipper's father is able to buy him out of this camp. It's a rare thing and it's something that certainly wouldn't happen later on in the 40s, but, but Zipper survives, he gets out. He spends the rest of the war in the Philippines with his wife, and then after the war, they immigrate to the United States and become US citizens. They spend the rest of their lives here in their adopted country. Meanwhile, his Dachau lead has spread all over the world. And in 1988, when he is 84 years old, he returns to his homeland, to Austria, and performs a 50th anniversary concert featuring this song. In the same year that Zipper was sent to Dachau, Jewish musicians and artists and other members of the Czech intelligentsia were being sent to a camp known as Terezin. It's what it's called in the Czech. The Germans called it Theresienstadt. It was about 30 kilometers outside of Prague, and it was officially labeled as a ghetto. But it didn't function really as a ghetto. It functioned as a concentration camp. And in this camp, as you would expect, they were subject to horrific conditions of um, lack of food, lack of all kinds of basic necessities, rampant disease. And they also lived daily with the fear of deportation because Terezin was also serving as a transit camp. Trains were coming all the time and taking people to the death camps in, at Treblinka and at Auschwitz. And there was going to be music, which we will talk about in a minute. But first I wanted to, to mention this, that one of the most tragic aspects of Terezin was the large number of children who were in this camp. During the war years, about 15,000 children were imprisoned in this camp. And the survival rate was dismal. Only about 100 of those children lived to see the end of the war. And, and the war was especially hard on children, as you can imagine, as they are suffering um, from, from the fear, from the deprivation, and they were watching their families go through this as well. And also their parents see these children as their only hope for the future, that these children need to survive, they need to continue on our culture. So thinking about music in Terezin, so since Terezin was the destination place for all of these um, musicians from, from Prague and surrounding areas. Um, Terzin was full of professional performers and conductors and composers. And, and so right away they wanted to make music and they began to make music in secret. Music was a necessity to them. Um, they, they had to have music in their life. One cellist found out that he was being deported to Terzin 
and he took his cello apart in all kinds of small pieces and hid them in his suitcase among the clothing, and he took some glue with him. And when he got back into the camp, he glued his cello together. This is what music meant to them. But in time, the Nazis had a different idea. They thought, you know what? We should actually encourage them to make music, and we can use that as propaganda. We can use that to convince the world that the Jews are being treated well. And so that, that became um, the, the plan. Terezin continued to, to evolve in a more and more elaborate propaganda plan, especially in 1944 when the International Red Cross wanted to pay a visit and wanted to see what was going on. And so in preparation for that visit, the Nazis began what they called a beautification process. They began to paint everything and plant flowers. They built a fake bank. They printed fake currency. They, they put up bakeries with food in it. It, it was an unbelievable charade. Anybody who looked too sick or too old, they shipped them off to Auschwitz. And so they set the stage for the Red Cross to come. And music was going to become an important part of that. They were going to have the Red Cross observe the music making for it. And, and it did. It, it convinced the Red Cross that, that all was well in Terezin. After the war, one of the survivors who had been a, a child in Terezin, he was asked, why in the world do you think that they were convinced by this charade? And he said, they only convinced the world because the world wanted to be convinced. It was easier. After the successful Red Cross visit, the Nazis forced a prisoner who was a filmmaker to begin to make a pseudo-documentary. This photo is one of the stills. They were going to use that to, again, to show the world how wonderful things were in Terezin. Um, it never gets released, and much of the footage is destroyed. We do have um, some of it, and there are some little musical excerpts on it. One of the talented composers and performers who was in Terezin was Hans Krasa. Before the war, he was internationally known. The Boston Symphony had premiered one of his symphonies. So he had this career. And then it's today, though, despite all of his symphonies and other works, that we remember him for this short children's opera that he wrote called Brundebar. Krasa had written Brundebar in the late 1930s before he came um, to Terezin, and it had premiered in a Jewish orphanage. It is a moral fairy tale. It is the story of two children who are doing battle against an evil organ grinder in the village whose name is Brundebar. And there are three kindly animals, a sparrow and a cat and a dog, who come to the aid of these two children along with the other children in the village. And eventually, they triumph over the evil um, organ grinder, and Brundabar is banished from their village. When Krasa arrived in Terezin and he saw the number of children that, was, that were there, he thought, we need to do this opera. I need to give the children something to do, something to focus on, something to distract them from their hunger and their fear. So he set out teaching them this opera. And it was performed 55 times in the camp. And there was no doubt for those who were sitting there in the audience, the fellow prisoners who were watching it, that Brundebar represented Hitler. I mean, look at the mustache if you can see it, okay? So there's some deliberate there in their, their costuming. But it seemed that the Nazis were either oblivious to this because they allowed it to go on. They allowed it to happen 55 times. They showed it for the Red Cross. Or they didn't care. 
They knew that they had placed a death sentence on all of these people, and so they thought, well, let them laugh and play for a few more days. The final few lines of Brenda Barr really tell us about the spirit and the intent of this piece, and it really shows us how music can be used in, in a spiritual resistance. It says, he who loves justice and will abide by it, and who is not afraid, is our friend and can play with us. Tragically, almost every child, performer, and audience member that was involved in Brundabar were murdered at Auschwitz. Almost 80 years later, Brundabar is still being performed all over the world. I read uh, an advertisement two days ago of a big production that's happening in Indianapolis this week. And, and why is it still being played? It's still being performed because we need the message of Brenda Barr in our world. We need to be reminded of the dangers of intolerance, of hatred, of prejudice. We need to be reminded of the power that the arts have to bring about peace and goodness in our world. And again, it's playing out um, in, in current events. I've been seeing violinists play in bomb shelters in Ukraine. We see defiant singing outside the opera house of Kiev. And I had a really good friend ask me last week, what is it like to see the theme of your book being played out on the world stage right now? And, and it's hard to have words for that. It, it's so heartbreaking what's happening. And, and yet, the hope of, of music, that we have the power of music that we have, I am so thankful for that. One of the few children who did survive was Ella Stein. Ella was 13 years old, and she played the role of the cat. When asked after the world, what it, after the war, what it meant for her and the children to sing together in the face of their suffering, she said, when we were singing, we forgot all our troubles. It was possible to have hope. Ella passed away in 2018. She lived a long time until age 87. May her memory be a blessing. I want to close uh, by talking about Raphael Schechter, another very talented Czech conductor and musician who was imprisoned in Terezin. When Schechter found out that he was being deported to Terezin, he didn't stick a cello in his suitcase. What he stuck were single copies of sheet music of great choral works and operas, and he just began to stuff them in there because he was convinced that wherever people were gathered, in particular wherever there was suffering, that there needed to be singing. And so when he got to the camp, he began to organize choirs, and they met in secret, and he got this smuggled piano. It, it's amazing, um, the, the heroism and the ingenuity of what they began to do. And he started to teach people great masterpieces. It's hard to imagine that in those settings where you were hungry and sick, that you could learn Mozart's magic flute, that you could learn that opera, or Mendelssohn's Elijah, that you could learn a huge oratorio. But they began to do that, and they began to perform it. Probably his most incredible task was assembling 150 singers to perform Verdi's Requiem Mass, which is a huge work and very complicated, but he did. And in September of 1943, they, they premiered that performance. And right after the performance, every singer was sent to Auschwitz. And Schechter was not deterred. He recruited another choir and taught them, and in January they gave a second performance. And almost all of the choir were sent to Auschwitz. And guess what he did? He recruited another choir, and they gave a third performance. And they gave 15 performances in total 
and he lost choir members after every one. That, that is a kind of resilience and, and something that I'm going to focus on um, tonight quite a bit, the, the thought of resilience. So the Verdi's Requiem performance was also part of this Red Cross ruse, and this is a photo from that. But as with the story of Brundebar, it seemed that the Nazi captors were oblivious to the messages that were being communicated there. Part of a Requiem Mass contains a, a movement called the Dies Irae in Latin. It is a text of judgment. And so these singers were singing these words. What horror must invade the mind when the approaching judge shall find and sift the deeds of all mankind, and now before the judge severe, all hidden things must plain appear. No crime can pass unpunished here. And so even though these singers had no guarantee that they were going to still be in Terezin the next day or even alive the next day, they sang defiantly and indictingly to their captors that they were going to be damned in the final judgment. So these are just a couple of the stories that um, I found as I was writing my book. And, and like I said, tonight I'll, I'll talk more about a couple of things. One would be the idea of resistance, but also the idea of resilience. What does it take to be resilient in the face of suffering? And how does music play the role of that? And an even more challenging thing is what is reconciliation? How can reconciliation happen in such horrific uh, situations? And, and what role can music play in some kind of reconciliation? Again, I thank you for um, this invitation and for your thoughtful attention today. <laughs>